Good morning, good, good evening, evening, good afternoon, afternoon to all our viewers and to our speakers. Thank you again for agreeing to be with us. Yes, yes. It's a wonderful, wonderful day outside, and yet uh, we have uh, we, we can see people joining to our broadcast. So I'm very happy to greet you at 101 all-in-one six iteration of the annual festival dedicated to technological art. So this year's iteration is uh, an unusual one. This is the first time we're doing something like that. Um, it is theoretically, we're thinking that we want to talk about these effective infrastructures of telepresence since we are in a very unusual situation. In one way, uh, on, on one hand, we are very unhappy that we cannot see uh, all our wonderful speakers here. But on the other hand, we have the opportunity to include three continents and six time zones. And hence my introduction, this is not out of absent-mindedness. This is the indication that uh, in this, situation we are capable to combine all this um, all these time zones in one day and so the program is made to accommodate to uh, these various time zones hence uh, the 12 hours so i will briefly explain what is uh, awaiting ahead of us and uh, how we are going to um, to exercise um, this this program. So uh, there will be three of us moderating this um, this conference. My name is Natalia Fyodorova and I'm artist and researcher. This is Aliya Sakhariva who is the head of Art and Science Center at Itmo University and we have Laura Rodriguez who is the researcher at the same Art and Science Center and also an artist. She works with bioart. So we are going to have five sections, one starting at 12 and the other one, uh, one starting at 12, which is called telemechanics. The other one starting at two, telefact. The third one starting at four, telehaptics, and I'm speaking Moscow time, telepresence at 6.30, and the final telecorporeality at nine. Uh, we uh, expect to finish at midnight uh, Moscow time. Uh, it is not going to be a um, television-like um, ongoing broadcasting. Uh, well, it is, but uh, not in terms of live presence of the speakers all the time. So we will also have uh, two films, Yerevon by uh, Gvinola Vegan, Stefan Dugutan and Pierre Kasunagies and Hareku by Andrei Nosov and Anna Tolkachova. Um, so the viewers, the ones, uh, this is always this feeling of, you know, throwing a bottle with a, with a message into the sea. So the viewers who I cannot see, but they hopefully are watching us, uh, please ask your questions uh, in the chat in Contacte and YouTube, and we will try our best to read these questions to our wonderful speakers. Um, so this, uh, this panel is moderating by me and all I'm going to do is um, give the floor to the speaker. So without any further ado, uh, I would like to uh, give the floor to Alec. We are very much looking forward. Uh, thanks very much, Natalia. Okay, well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to participate. Uh, since the mid 1990s, uh, I've been interested in remote access and animation of the human body and its machines. So uh, it's very pleasing to be able to participate and also 
to hear some of the other uh, speakers at this uh, conference. So when we talk about uh, uh, teleoperation, um, this is a means of augmenting and extending the body. Um, but it can be more than telemechanics, uh, which is the remote control of machines. Um, now, for example, with uh, reading and writing of electrical muscle stimulation, it's possible to uh, map these signals uh, uh, from my limbs here to someone else's muscles over there, able to replicate a task uh, remotely. Uh, the third hand was the first augmentation and extending uh, of my body um, with uh, uh, technology. And it's a three degree of freedom pinch release, grasp release mechanism, but actuated by electrical signals on the um, uh, muscles of the abdomen and the legs. And it has a tactile feedback system for a rudimentary sense of touch. And that touch could be felt by a series of, uh, of electrodes on my arm, which uh, provided an electrical stimulation, uh, the intensity of which matched uh, the uh, grip that you were grasping with. And of course, uh, attaching technology to, to your body, uh, here it was really just a visual attachment for performance. Uh, but an attaching technology uh, to the body uh, means that um, the, the body is uh, simply extending its operational capabilities. Um, but now extending the body online, uh, then you have a, a situation where you're extending and also extruding uh, the body's uh, sense of self. And this extrusion, in fact, uh, generates an existential and ontological emptiness. And uh, the body uh, becomes a component uh, in a much more complex operational architecture. In fact, the body becomes this uh, contemporary chimera of meat, uh, metal and code. Using this uh, muscle stimulation system, the blue switches indicate uh, which muscles can be actuated, which muscles can be programmed uh, with, your, with your laptop. Um, and with a touchscreen interface, by touching the muscles on the computer model, the computer model uh, simulates your movements. And then uh, a second later in Luxembourg, where my body was, uh, the body performed involuntarily. Uh, so, in fact, people in the Pompidou Centre in Paris, the Media Lab in Helsinki, the Doors of Perception Conference in, in Amsterdam could remotely access and remotely choreograph my body. So this body has a kind of split body experience. Uh, the left side, uh, voltage in, involuntary uh, movements, uh, the right side controlling a third hand voltage out. So this split body uh, is an important sort of um, experience in this remote sharing of agency. So engineering um, and uh, extending uh, the operational architecture of the body is what uh, this is all about. And with uh, remote um, uh, operations of bodies and machines, it's interesting that a presence is, is kind of marked with a double absence. You know, we're neither all here, nor are we all there. 
but partly here sometimes and partly there at other times. And of course, the intention is to generate an experience um, remotely of intimacy without proximity, without physical presence. So embodiment, agency, and performing, um, the, uh, these really need to be reconsidered and recon, uh, recon, reconfigured. So the interest is to construct choreographies of an artificial of aliveness. And this artificial aliveness has to go beyond the individual, beyond the proximal of split bodies and, and also phantom bodies. Uh, with ping body, as opposed to people in other places, remotely uh, accessing and interacting with the body, here the body is actuated by detecting ping signals from 40 global locations. So the bo body here becomes this involuntary performance uh, of uh, indicating um, internet activity. It's a barometer of, of net activity. Um, so the body here is, is indicative of uh, data streams. So in this performance, uh, a customized search engine scans the net, selects images, anatomical images from the, the web, shows them to my uh, uh, heads up display. These images are analyzed for their complexity and then mapped to my body's muscles. And the body then is indicative of the images that it sees. In other words, the body moves to the images uh, that it, uh, are uh, uh, detected on the internet. Also, the body is uh, uh, having sensors on its head, arms, and legs. And as the body moves involuntarily, according to the images that it sees, it becomes the video switcher and the video mixer. So here, uh, the performance indicates how the body is cinematically mixing live as part of the performance, um, uh, this parasite event. The body becomes uh, parasitic uh, to the uh, the internet, the computational systems, um, the muscle stimulation that's actuating it. Um, it's a component in this extended operational system. Movatar was a, a, a performance where it was an inverse motion capture system. So imagine an avatar imbued with genetic algorithms, in other words, with a rudimentary AI, being able to access a physical body and perform with it in the real world. So instead of me actuating my avatar here, the avatar accesses a physical body and performs with it in the real world. In this case, uh, via the upper body uh, exoskeleton. So 
here we, we, we really uh, have to consider this transition from the physical to the phantom body. Um, this is an age of fractal and phantom flesh. By fractal flesh, I mean bodies and bits of bodies, spatially separated, electronically connected, generating recurring patterns of interactivity at varying scales. With phantoms, uh, with phantom flesh, phantoms are now proliferating online. And with the increasing development of, of haptic devices, Phantom flesh is not merely any longer phantasmatic, but it's increasingly uh, being experienced uh, as phantom limb. Um, so having a sensation of force, force feedback, for, for example, generates a more uh, potent physical uh, presence of a, of a remote uh, body. And Although now phantoms are only flattened on screens, screens are, are our interfaces with our phantoms, they are increasingly uh, having both optic and haptic thickness. With micro miniaturization and, and nano scaling, uh, teleoperation, telemechanics, will not only be operating uh, remote distances, but also more intimately uh, inside the human body. Whereas extending and extruding the body empties the body online, uh, teleoperating technology inside the body uh, um, fills it up with these components devices, micro miniaturized sensors, and, and, and even nanoscaled uh, machines. In 1993, in fact, I designed a sculpture for the inside of my body, a kind of an aesthetic gesture to the increasing intimacy and control of technology inside the body. Um, closed, it's a capsule. Um, but uh, with the help of an endoscopist, it was inserted 30 centimetres into the stomach cavity, into the inflated stomach. Uh, inside the stomach, the sculpture opens and closes, extends and retracts, has a flashing light and a beeping sound, a kind of machine choreography uh, inside the human body. The theme of the fifth Australian sculpture triennale, in fact, was site-specific works. <laughs> but instead of a, a sculpture for a public space, this becomes a sculpture for a private internal space. So here the body is not simply a site for the psyche, but simply a host for a sculpture. In fact, now we're becoming more and more coupled and complicit with our technology. Uh, the body becomes this extended operational system of bodily metabolism, machine musculature, and computational uh, calculation. Stick man is a simple, minimal, full body exoskeleton that algorithmically actuates um, the, the body. Here, the performance was for uh, five uh, hours. And here, the body becomes simultaneously a possessed and performing body, simultaneously possessed by its exoskeleton and algorithm, but also having some agency uh, being able to swivel on its leg and manipulate the shadow and video uh, feedback uh, that is projected uh, behind it. With this 
this five hour performance, uh, visitors to the to the gallery could also manipulate um, the mini stick man and press play and insert their choreography into the performance. So the body was not only performing to the algorithm, but also performing to people inserting their own actions, a kind of, you know, electronic voodoo. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the exoskeleton arm was engineered for uh, the rewired, remixed performance. And this performance was first uh, done in um, uh, at the Perth Institute of Contemporary Art. So for five days, uh, six hours every day, continuously, you could only see with the eyes of someone in London. You could only hear with the ears of someone in New York. But anyone, anywhere could access my right arm and remote control it. So it's a kind of sharing of visual and acoustical uh, uh, senses and a sharing, a distributing of agency. So this was a um, another iteration of that original performance. <clears throat> it was done in Europe, uh, live streamed, um, and um, between uh, Basel, Antwerp, and Eindhoven, where my body was. Again, I could only see with the eyes of someone in Antwerp. I could only hear with the ears of someone in Basel, but anyone anywhere could access my right arm and a remote control it. I didn't know what I was going to see, what I was going to hear, uh, and when anyone was going to move my body. Reclining Stickman is the um, most recent uh, project for the uh, uh, Adelaide Biennale of Australian Art. This is a nine degree of freedom, uh, large uh, uh, nine meter long robot actuated by pneumatic rubber muscles. Um, you can access this robot online and remote uh, uh, insert your own choreography. And there was also a five hour performance where my body was attached to the torso of the robot. Uh, I could insert my movements through a pair of uh, pneumatic joysticks and I was improvising to other people uh, at the same time, either locally or remotely, inserting their own movements into uh, the reclining stick man. You have to imagine that the pneumatic rubber muscles are with compressed air, are inflating and contracting, exhausting and extending.
So this performance is um, also uh, video streamed um, and hopefully there'll be another five hour performance um, if we can travel interstate <laughs> um, in a few weeks. But um, with uh, adequate and high fidelity feedback loops, there's going to be a transition between the notion of Marvin Minsky of telepresence to Sasumi Tachi's idea of teleexistence. Uh, in other words, if you see what the remote agent does, uh, sees, if the remote uh, and you, you uh, 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 do what the remote agent does, uh, whether it's another body or a robot, what you experience is no longer mere presence. Bodies become, in fact, actual end defectors. So for remote agents in other places and for machines elsewhere. In other words, the psychological and spatial distance between the body and the remote agent, whether it's another body or another robot, collapses into one single and instant experience of operation. Again, the body as this alternate anatomical architecture, as an extended operational uh, system, the body as a kind of contemporary chimera of meat, metal, and code. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this talk. Um, it, it is this um, very special moment of having read uh, about your work, having seen about your work in the first time, um, having you uh, being in the same, you know, what, what is it the same, in the same absence, or in the same double absence with you. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah so, um, your work uh, has always been uh, reinventing what uh, what the body is and what the body can be and reinventing the relationship between the machine and bodies. So um, my question is about this double absence, uh, this uh, connection that is created between the remote audience, between the mechanism, between your body. Um, I would think of it as multiple presence and you also use it to the fractal flash. So what would be your wording of the present condition? Is it more about a fractal absence or is it more about fractal presence to you? Yeah, uh, I mean, it, I think we really have to um, uh, be aware and uh, be uh, constantly uh, re-examining these relationships of the body uh, with its technologies and what kind of uh, operations are possible and what kind of subjective experiences um, result. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think uh, the idea, the ideas that were generated from these performances like the rewired remixed performance um, and, and, and also um, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, reclining stick man performance is is that we need to uh, uh, reconsider simplistic notions of identity uh, and mm -hmm. uh, simple uh, notions of embodiment mm -hmm. and and agency. So uh, it becomes a much more complex collaborative. A system of, of interaction. And depending on how high fidelity the <laughs> feedback loops will be, how instant, uh, uh, but in the meantime, we may have to perform if there is a lag uh, over very, very long distances, uh, we may have to perform increasingly with uh, forward masking. Uh, in other words, in a sense, a kind of a, a predictive, a predictive mm -hmm. 
uh, visual simulation uh, that anticipates uh, your actions and gives you real time uh, or, or the experience of real time feedback. So, which means that uh, the the real time uh, that you experience should be um, like forty minutes, uh, forty seconds ahead of your. Uh, of, like you have to predict your experience, so the real becomes slightly future. Like we would yes, talk. and and actually, um, in in fact, that's how our bodies operate in the world. Um, we have a certain expectation. Uh, and um, surprise is what happens when the real world it's is different from our expectations of it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so very much for your talk. So uh, I'll give the word to our next speaker. We have a question in our chat. Oh, sure. Yeah, go ahead. We have okay. uh, yep. one minute for... Okay, Patrick is asking, <laughs> do you think with the coming with the more integration of Internet of Things that much of what you have been interrogating will become more explicit in regards to bodies, technologies, and formation? Yeah, I mean, the, the two uh, contemporary uh, th uh, sort of theories or philosophies that are of interest, Laura, for me, are um, actor network theory and um, object-oriented ontology. And uh, Bruno Latour's idea that um, our capabilities lie in our relationships within the network. Um, in, in other words, uh, the individual becomes uh, less, less critical uh, in, in this um, interwoven uh, mesh of, of, of interactivity. Um, Object-oriented ontology is also interesting for me because um, it uh, generates a very, very uh, unexpected uh, definition of an object. An object isn't just a kind of a material substance, but um, it can be uh, uh, an object, can be a microbe, an algorithm, uh, um, a body, an instrument, a cloud, the climate, um, and that you can't reduce an object neither to its uh, component parts nor to its effects. So uh, it, it makes the object withdraw and become a more uncanny uh, and more uh, um, a more problematic uh, uh, thing. So, uh, although actor network theory focuses on the relationships of um, of objects and bodies and 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 cultural institutions within a network, uh, object oriented ontology, um, even though these are both flattened ontologies. Um, takes a slightly more problematic and uncanny view of what an object is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I see the Patrick's question. And uh, if you allow, I will just move your question to the end of our panel so that we keep on time with, with the schedule, even though we have a slight shift. And uh, instead of Paul, we are going to have Maris Benayoun. So at this moment i give the word to maris benayoun welcome okay i was just uh, thanking uh, uh laura and natalia for this kind of invitation and i'm sorry for the switch but i i had some constraint right after and i will have to run we away figured, unfortunately so i will watch the i will watch the 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 video afterward to be sure not to miss uh any uh, uh, any of the talks, yeah, it's uh, actually uh, of course a very uh, important topic to me. Uh, the question of uh, uh, telepresence and uh, and uh, connection, and I will I, I will take some examples from my works where I deal with this question. 
relation between people, between the humankind, uh, at the humankind level, and how uh, we make sense out of it, and what do we understand from the recent uh, mutation related technologies. So I, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, I have to find. Uh, I have to find my. Uh, wow, why is it? <laughs> so I, uh, I lost. Uh, uh, no, I cannot lose. I, no, sorry, this should be here. Um, I cannot find keynote. <laughs> well, um, talk. Okay, I can I can make gesture if you want something yeah, yeah, more yeah. Uh, bodily engaged uh, thing, and uh, I, I think it uh, it would be probably more uh, more exciting. Uh, not sure actually. I mean, <laughs> Uh, where is it? Damn it. Uh, <laughs> I'll take half a minute more and we can probably... Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I have it here. So uh, I should have instant... Should I have this in my list? Okay, uh, let me close the share and start the share again, maybe. It's uh, only about that. Yes. Oh, sorry for this. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, yeah, we, we, we know the problem. You, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, I used to say that I hate computers and technology, and uh, I think they will die soon. And <laughs> I, uh, say I, I was probably right. <laughs> <laughs> no, when, when, when I used to say they will die, I. I meant uh, they will be part of the world without being, without the being noticed, uh, mm -hmm. like uh, electricity. Who mentioned electricity? <laughs> Nobody mentions electricity in the in the art making process, even if we mm -hmm. need light uh, uh, to make it. So uh, I have to. Okay, I will try to figure out how to avoid to have this. Uh, so, yes, I would like to talk about different aspects of, uh, of, uh, of uh, artworks and their relation to the people. And, uh, of course, I'm, I guess I'm invited to talk about old stuff like uh, the Tunnel Under the Atlantic in 95, uh, when we connected the Centre Pompidou in Paris and, uh, and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Montreal. So the interesting thing is you see on the top, it's Montreal, on the bottom, it's Paris. And there were a lot of people in Paris, more probably than in Montreal. It was during Isdia Montreal. So it's uh, exactly now 25 years ago. And uh, I, I wanted to do something to, to start working on the idea of obstacle. Uh, what kind of obstacle do we want to uh, remove with technology and what do you what do we expect from this experience? And so I decided that the main obstacle between France and Canada was a cultural obstacle, nothing to do with a, uh, with a, a ground or underground of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, it was more about that. So people were digging into a material made of pictures, mostly, from the common past of, um, of both countries. And, and digging in the picture, they could see fragments uh, and create big caves like that. And they could see uh, fragments of the memory. And during this time, they could talk to each other. And so the voice gave the direction where to go. Uh, and so uh, normally they should meet, but this happened only after five days. But they still could talk from the beginning. And when they were talking, uh, their, their face was floating in the space, in the virtual space like that. So of course you didn't recognize me. And here, this is the first meeting after five days.
we can see you in Montreal. Ha ha ha. You're dressed in white with a white color. In red, sorry. You're dressed in red with a white color. Uh, for me, this sentence is very important because uh, imagine 95 was the real beginning of the web. And so people could start communicating easier without knowing anything about, about computers and things like that. What is important to say, uh, because it was a big confusion at the time, it was at the same time a big success because it was a big event. And, and at the same time, some people were saying, this is not art, this is using technology. And it's a performance to glorify information technology. Uh, and this is, the tunnel was not about technology, even if we had uh, something like 10 computers each side. And so uh, what I wanted to, to address was a raising of the fatigue dimension of communication, of human communication. So what does it mean? The fatigue dimension is a very important part of communication when you establish the contact and you maintain it. It's not about uh, transmitting messages. It's all about building the connection. Something like, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. No, 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 please, please try to move a little bit on the right. Yes, okay, now I can see you as well. Oh, you're dressed in red with a white color. Everything is said. Of course, it has nothing to do with a specific message. And this is exactly what Alfred Hitchcock called the MacGuffin, you know, in the, is, uh, uh, in the book where he talks with uh, François Truffaut. The MacGuffin is the thing that nobody knows what it is about, but everybody wonder where it is and should catch it. And so here, nobody had something specific to transmit as an information, but People wanted to get there, wanted to get together, wanted to establish a contact. And emotionally speaking, after, after the five days of digging, uh, it was really intense. When people met for the first time, the time you see uh, on the video, uh, the intensity of this, uh, uh, of this moment was really impossible to imagine before. And you have to understand that the public used to come one or two hours a day, every day. So some used to come two hours every day uh, to be there at the right moment, at the meeting time. There, there are even love stories about that that create, were created at this time. So that's uh, interesting. Something else which uh, should be considered is the tunnel under the Atlantic at the same time I had to, res to so solve some technical problem, but also to, uh, to figure out how to build the next generation of works, the kind of work where, uh, uh, where uh, virtuality would become a medium. So it was about uh, all what you see here, but what was important is that the artwork used to work like a society of agents. It's a community of agents. So you had the librarian who was a content manager. The content manager used to observe how you're interested by what you see and to recommend the next pictures and select the picture for you. And so the, it was a dynamic reshuffling of all the content in order to provide something totally bespoke for the visitor. The architect, there is no pre-built architecture here. So the architecture is a result of the experience of meeting and the experience of digging. So it's a, like a footprint in the materiality of the obstacle. The video director, uh, people don't know, but uh, I recorded 21 hours of the digging uh, with a video director choosing the position of the camera the camera to choose on the people, the people, the speakers, that what the speaker is looking at and so on. This was totally automatic. This was created to work uh, alone here. Photo reporter, because it was possible to, to get series of capture, and I have 500 captures 
uh, from inside the tunnel. And a composer, because uh, music work, like it happened in many of my works after, uh, are totally determined by the action, uh, the digging, the opening, the content, specific content of features and so on. So that was, uh, for me, uh, one of the key things uh, in the work. In 2012, so after this one, I did the Paris New Delhi Tunnel in uh, 1997, and then uh, Tunnel Around the World in 2012. And this was uh, between 01 Biennial in uh, San Jose, uh, Creative Media Center in Hong Kong, sat in Montreal, and, and some people in New York, and also Seoul Museum of Art for Media City so on. Uh, here it's interesting because you see, you will see uh, some of my students who totally ignored the work, didn't know what it was about. I just asked them to interact with it. Oh, the content was from, uh, uh, the content was coming from the French Museum collection. So, uh, hundreds of thousands of images uh, from the museum. But it was not about that, it was about uh, the experience of discovering, uh, discovering this content and maybe take time. So what is interesting is the behavior of the visitors. Uh, and uh, they did plenty of things that I didn't expect. I had no reason to imagine they would do that but they did it because it worked. I was capturing only one thing, is the distance between the people and the screen. So if they do that, swimming, they change the distance. So the image is really reacting quite physically uh, to the experience. And, and, and this is funny because they, they go up to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, to swim downward with a screen in the back, or things like that. <laughs> you see, this is a, uh, uh, this comes totally naturally. And then they meet the people. And when they meet the people, they start talking with the usual thing, uh, where are you, uh, what are you doing? So you see the, the, the back swimmer. It's a physical experience and they are not in the dark. It's not, there is no emotion uh, as a dark thing. They are just in front of a screen. And I, I thought this was uh, uh, interesting to experience that. Okay, uh, 2016, we celebrated uh, on the 20 years of the tunnel uh, in Osage Gallery by creating this uh, Just the Git show. Uh, where I install, uh, you know, la like the corpse, li like the skeleton of the tunnel, because now we don't need anymore to have tubes to uh, protect the light of the projector. Now projectors can be in open air and it works. So uh, it was uh, different tunnels. One of them was a recording of the tunnel under the Atlantic. Uh, one was a colors tunnel. Uh, that automatically reorganize the content according to colors, but from the content coming from the web. So very quickly in Hong Kong, you discover that red may be related to the Chinese flag, Chinese culture, but also the Hong Kong flag and so on. And many things like that, uh, like a yellow related to umbrella revolution and so on. So it's a way to talk about serious topic, uh, just saying, oh, just about colors. And this is another, uh, another tunnel, which is a borders tunnel based on content related to countries and borders uh, coming from the web. And so people were digging the gallery from one side to another, and then I will show you another version. So that was uh, just the Git show with the color tunnels on the left. And then uh, I did another show uh, between Nanjing and Hong Kong. So uh, it was Nanjing uh, Museum of Art, where uh, we work also with students. Oh, okay, I have no pictures because some are pretty similar to the previous one. Uh, so the, uh, the border diggers 
uh, were actually works made by students working on the concept of obstacle. So some have been working, for example, on age as an obstacle to communication. Some other uh, were working on distortion related to, to meteorology or to, to uh, weather and, and, and many other topics like that. But the interesting thing is that this tunnel uh, these tunnels were dug between China and Hong Kong. I skipped this, uh, the details. La was in 2000, in 2000. Yeah, it was a work in uh, three different cities, uh, Brussels, uh, Contemporary Art Center, Lyon, and Dakar. And this work was a reference to Library of Babel uh, from uh, Borges. And uh, people were in this kind of infinite labyrinth and they uh, were talking to each other. And when they talk, what they say is written, start generating a text, which is written on the walls that you look at. So if you do go to another room, the, uh, the text is written in the new walls. So you see here Jean-Baptiste Barrière on the right, on, on the right, who made all the things, the sound work with the fact that letters and words are read. So you're actually moving inside the text, telling the story of meeting somebody who is in a different city. Unfortunately, we did it only once because it was in French. <laughs> and, uh, we, we haven't done an uh, English version yet, but we should have done it because it was quite nice to experience. Crossing Talks was in 99, actually, the year before. Uh, it was in, in the ICC, uh, entity ICC center in Tokyo, where people were inside a cave and in a world made of an infinite number of caves, communicating with people in uh, on the internet. So we had an additional internet booth in the show, but you could communicate from elsewhere. And, and the thing was about how you modify your relation to the people you share the space with uh, because of remote communication. So here, if you're talking to somebody far away, you don't care to the people around you. But then you discover that if you stay on the left or the right of, the, of uh, uh, the cave, then the world tilts and you sleep from one room to another. And, and it can go very fast. So the only way to talk to somebody far away uh, remotely is to agree with the people around you uh, to stabilize the world. And this is what I call the elevator effect at the fact that people don't say anything until the accident or the incident. There is something happening, suddenly people start talking. And so it's all about this relation. Should, can I talk? Uh, what you see on the walls is, is people, some of them are pre-recorded, but there is always one with effectively there. Uh, and, and so you start communicating and then the language is different. And sometimes you can talk with somebody and, uh, uh, and start saying something. And then you have to take into account the other people who maybe want to move elsewhere and so on. So this is Crossing Talks Communication Rafting, that uh, the title of the book. I go away. Art Impact was about sharing something else, uh, sharing the experience of watching. So in the Pompidou Center in 2000, I gave the possibility to the visitors to see a show in Avignon on beauty, a show on beauty in Avignon. Jean de Loisy was the creator. Uh, and the day before the opening, it was possible to see it in the Pompidou Center. So they, this is a, a kind of remote provocation. But what was important was not, it was not to, um, uh, it was not to be able only to experience the, the the panoramic photos of what was going on in Avignon, but also the fact that what you look at is actually painted in real time 
on what we call the, uh, when I say painting, virtually painted, on what I call the collective retinal memory. And so people could see online or in the show the result of watching a different thing. So you focus on something, and then what you focus on uh, becomes the uh, part of this combination. So what does it mean? It means that the result of the experience will be a kind of a, a retinal competition between different contents. Some contents were artworks, some other were related to the daily life, like the supermarket or the slaughterhouse. And so you see that the supermarket may be more attractive to people with via uh, goggles or via binoculars than some artworks. And this competition is interesting because it's, it is uh, uh, the competition that happens in real time. And so you see what people are watching just by seeing this airbrush effect on the, uh, on the collective retinal memory. Uh, I have to go faster, so I will skip plenty of things. So this is the beginning. And this is the experience. The Cosmopolis was uh, 2005. Telescopes to do the same thing, works on the collective retinal memory, but with cities. So panoramas of cities, this is Shanghai in 2005. And so the experience helped people not only to discover the cities, but also to rebuild another city by watching the other. So there are 12 telescopes, and these telescopes combine and create this retinal experience where people share the experience of watching cities. And so it's a series made by only appealing, let's say, elements of architecture and urbanism. Of course, it looks like kind of military thing, and it was in a military uh, warehouse here. Uh, this was in Shanghai, where uh, got more than 10,000 people coming. So you see remote uh, uh, telepresence can be very present. Uh, 10,000 people a day, every day. So that's where it's interesting to make shows in China. This was the opening in Chongqing. And this was the show for the opening of the Three Gorge Museum in Chongqing. I was really fascinated by the, uh, how people were interested to see what happens elsewhere. Watch out, it's a work with uh, boxes in the street where uh, when you look inside the box, it tells you to send a warning message to the world. Uh, and you don't notice immediately that actually when you look in, inside the box, your eye is watching the world. And as you don't find that very exciting, uh, this is a kind of big browser that looks totally bored by, uh, by what they see. And this is a kind of cave feedback where uh, you're inside the box. That was in Athens, same kind of scene, the horizon, we have no time for that. This is about considering internet as a well nervous system. And so you can consider that everyone uh, is the nerve ending of a global body. So uh, I started that in uh, working on that in uh, 2005. Uh, and so uh, this is the, the change in relation between people. Now we are just feeding this global body with constant stream of things. So I started making maps, sculptures, shops, no time for that. And, and to pay attention to emotions. So after uh, paying attention to information, paying attention to world emotion compared to financial stock. And so with the same principle of analyzing the web, uh, I got information about the emotional state of 3,200 cities around, around the world. And uh, it was presented in New York and here in Seoul, it's a version I like because the sound is from really a recording from this. Uh, this is a Salvation Army. Uh, it was Christmas time and comparing the emotional state and the financial stock on a building with traders inside the building. I, am, I finish with that. 
So this is what I'm working on. And uh, I want to show you this video, which I just, uh, uh, I just finished a few days ago. And it's about the series of works uh, called Brain Factory and more recently, uh, Value of Values. So we start considering that attractions are like living beings in your brain and you can assess the evolution of this shape in order to make it uh, related to, to relate it to some world describing attractions or here space, for example, or worlds of values, human values. And so the brain workers, Oh, that's not, the, that's not the good version of the video. I'm sorry. <laughs> I took the wrong one. Okay, that's not a problem. It's just um, tell you. So during the show, people come spend about eight minutes uh, to control the evolution of the shape. And the next one will improve this shape. Uh, and they get something like happiness, love, power, money. And they have to help creating the best shape for these words. Then they are registered on the, on the blockchain. And so you have instantly a wallet and this token gets into your collection. Uh, so you have created this shape, it's yours, and you can uh, uh, batter it, uh, give, uh, offer it to somebody or uh, sell it. And this is interesting because of course, the, the price of the, of the values will rank the values according to, uh, according to the importance of these values. And when you barter peace, uh, peace for money, for example, oh, I have peace uh, 32, you have money 110, uh, so I would like your money. Uh, do you want my peace? This generates a transactional uh, poetry automatically. And so you get ethical statement like that. And so if you uh, barter money for love, for example, uh, it may become, you always need more money to find love. And that's what the system generates out of transactions. So this is how values make sense by being traded. This is what I call that transactional art. And of course your collection of VOVs, value of values, define yourself in terms of a system of values. So there is a scientist who uh, try to create a periodic table of values and organize the values according to the collection. So if somebody, if people collecting sex have, have also pleasure, some collecting money may want power and fame and this reorganize the values. And so another version of the system allows you to create new writings, new way to write the, the value. And so the reader is in the artificial intelligence that try to interpret this new writing, this calligraphy, and the interpreter uh, will try to figure out how these different words found by the readers can become, uh, can make sense. So this is the, not the last version of the video. It, uh, the last one is online on YouTube. Nice. So you then, so then people can make uh, artwork out of, uh, out of the token they got because they, they own it, they design it. And so it can become this or make, become fashion for people who want to display their values or become some other uh, art installation, something like that. And this reification will be exhibited during the shows we have being created already. So this is purity, for example, that becomes uh, an inflatable sculpture. This is the footprint of freedom, and this is democracy. And, and this is a big reificator. I just tell you about this one and I stopped because it seems <laughs> that I am- uh, uh, Yeah, I'm, you're uh, three minutes behind. Yeah. Okay, that's, uh, that, that's not, uh, okay. I have, uh, this is not what I want to show you. So that's uh, the new design of the, of the tokens. Uh, they will be in KEDAF art fair, digital art fair uh, on the 25th. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just, I just want to show you this. 
So you remember when I mentioned for the tunnel that it was a society of uh, entities that make the artwork. Mm -hmm. Same here, it's a society of agents. It's kind of multi-agent system, but these agents behave like people. And so the spectator uh, is part of the artwork. So mm -hmm. it, is, it becomes an artist, then a curator selecting the relevant artworks for the topic. It becomes a collector. Uh, and then an art dealer, because he can sell it. And then a trader, because he can speculate on the value of values. And the artwork itself uh, includes a generator that starts a shape, a calligrapher, a printer, a reader, an interpreter, a scientist, an analyst, an accountant, and a poet. So uh, I'm working now on the online version uh, because of the COVID and, uh, and whatever may happen that justify people to work at remotely. And so, uh, and so that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you for your Thank patience you, and uh, for oh, wait, accepting uh... one extra minute. <laughs> <laughs> that was four extra minutes, actually. Four extra minutes, I'm really <laughs> sorry. You should have kept right. me. So we will, uh, next time, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Uh, so we will uh, please remember your questions to Maurice. Uh, so just not to be further behind, uh, I'll give the word to Stol Dmitry Morozov. Dima, are you with us? Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, I am. Yay, good. Hi. Uh, that seems to be very dark where you are. Where is that? I, I can. I don't know. No, that's all right. Actually, it's it's, it's just up workshop. to you. If you want to be in the darkness, that's. But yeah, if if you if you can see me well, then. Yeah, yeah, we can see you perfectly well. Okay. Yeah. So um, it's a bit complicated to talk now after such amazing speakers. So, but I used to. So. <laughs> um, I'm a multidisciplinary artist uh, working on the field of technologies. Uh, and um, during the last 10 years, I have, met, uh, I have made a lot of projects that are somehow, I, I think, I hope, are related to our topic. And maybe not completely, but uh, I, I would like to, to share them with you. And uh, um, I, I usually don't do prepare talks uh, with some keynote presentations, something like that. So I'm mostly just using my website where I have uh, most of the documentations I have made, uh, the projects I have made. Uh, and uh, this gives me a bit of uh, flexibility in my, in my talk. Uh, and at the same time, um, I, can, I can always change my direction. Yeah. So, and if you have any questions, you can like, immediately ask me during, during the process. And uh, yeah. So um, I was I was uh, always um, interested in uh, different ways how uh, technologies affect body, how body can affect technologies, and uh, between you know different how how everything is connected now, and uh, I have made many many projects that involve uh, human body, not just as inter interactive. Uh, actor but also like as a source of energy for example uh, and uh, some of these projects are quite ironical others are very serious for me or you know, for audience and yeah I, I will just share the screen now and um, start showing what i have prepared what i wanted to show so um, yeah, just a second i'm always forgetting how to do that okay Uh, is it working now? You can see the website, right? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. Um, the first work I wanted to show is called Until I Die. And uh, I made this work in 2016. And it was uh, commissioned by a Capelice gallery in Ljubljana, where a well-known place for uh, crazy experimental projects related to, you know, different aspects of... Um, um, how how body can be used, let's call it like this, in, in art. Uh, and uh, during 20, 
years, I think they made a crazy amount of different projects, commissions and shows related to this. So um, this work is actually a sound installation, uh, which is uh, made out of the electrical batteries uh, that are filled with my blood. So during a uh, year and a half, I was collecting my blood and uh, preserving it, uh, storing it, um, a bit modifying to keep it, let's call it fresh. And then at the end of uh, this uh, period of year and a half, and I had enough of blood, uh, I made a show in Kapelitsa where I had the last portion, when I, where I took a last portion from, from, my, uh, from my body uh, to, the, to the last jar, which is left uh, empty before the, before the start of the show. So it was kind of a performance presentation. And when I had that last uh, portion, uh, I switch on the, the installation. So it, it started uh, to work and started to sound. And it was producing a very, um, it was producing electricity by a very simple way, uh, just by, um, so it, it's based on the same technologies as the, 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 the first earlier, the, 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 the earliest batteries, uh, DC batteries were made just by using uh, oxidation of metals uh, and metals of, of different ratio and addition speed of this uh, oxidation. So I was using just two electrodes in, in each of these uh, 55 jars uh, to produce really small current, but uh, by multiplying this electricity, by uh, collecting you know, small current from uh, all of these 55 jars, I was, I was getting enough of power to, uh, to power a small, enough of energy to power a small um, algorithmical uh, electronic circuit that was producing uh, generative music. So and it was very important for me to produce generative music, not just uh, a record or something like that, because it was like an autonomous composer powered by my own energy, by you know, by the, my own blood, by yeah, energy. So and it was actually a copy of myself because I'm working a lot with the sound. And during last years, I've made many many performances and installations um, working with sound. And I was quite tired, I would say. I mean, uh, tired not from doing that, but just like physically. And I decided that I should make something like a copy of myself, which will be in the same time very fragile and quite crazy, like a Buddhist mandala, something that is, you know, like created uh, with a very, with a big passion. And uh, in the same time, it, 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 it uh, needs some skills to do that and a lot of time and energy, but then, it can work only, you know, for for minutes or you know seconds if it's a Buddhist mandala or just a moment. In my case, it was just few hours. So this is why it also was called "Until I Die" because uh, the process was uh, like it took me so long to 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 make it, and then at the end uh, it was working just for a very short time. And uh, what we were observing in the gallery for three days of the show of uh, this ongoing installation is how the system was losing its energy. And for me, it was quite poetic to see almost my own death on the, on the stage in the same time. So I will not show the video, but I, I will just switch to, to the next one, but you could see the video on the website, which is explaining the, the whole concept. There is many, many more theoretical and um, you know, different uh, philosophical background behind this project related to the Russian cosmism, to my own uh, personal experiences, etc. But I think uh, it's, it's, it could be an interesting project for, for um, you know, uh, it, maybe it's not an illustration of what is happening right now, but uh, for me it was like, when, when I get the topic of, of this conference, uh, that was the first project that came to my mind, which I wanted to share with you. So uh, the next project which I wanted to show, which is also involving body a bit more directly this, this time uh, and not that uh, invasive. <laughs> I don't know if it's this word, if, if, if this word is proper. Uh, and uh, I think it's really fits to the situation right now. Also somehow, I mean, at least, at least visually, it's uh, very related to our you know, days now and everything was happening. And, but I made this project uh, in 2019, actually a year ago. And um, it, it, for me, it's very like important, I would say, that 
uh, I get this experience of fear, which we are all passing through now, uh, the fear of uh, disease, the fear of virus. A year before, most of the people, you know, get it right now. So it was like a bit of prediction, <laughs> uh, I would say. And uh, I was in India. I, every year I go to India um, in, in winter just to chill, to, to read books, you know, to restart my year. And so it's, it's already become a tradition. I made it already like five, five times in a row or something like that. And uh, last year uh, I got some strange virus, uh, which is quite common. You know, you're in Asia and I'm from Europe. I have a different immune system. And India is very like hardcore country, I would say, speaking about um, infections. Yeah, it's quite common there. And um, I got some strange virus. I got a high fever and nothing else. So quite uh, similar to what is, you know, people are often experiencing right now. Uh, and I don't have a fear of death, I would say. But that virus was quite psychedelic, I would say. It really affects my brain and my nerve system i become very fragile i would say like very sensitive to even to light uh, sensitive to fear it was like more a physical feeling than my mind was really like stressed and um, that feeling stayed for for a while with me even when i was already like fine completely and recover from it it took me just a couple of days to like fight this i had no medicine taken or doctor uh, I, I didn't even call the doctor, so. But uh, when I came home uh, to, to Moscow from that trip, uh, I still had that uh, feeling more as a memory, and I decided that um, it could be a nice starting point for a, for a new project, actually. So kind of a sublimation of this fear, kind of sublimation of this, uh, you know, uh, process I was passing through, uh, and uh, it really helped me at the end, actually. It helped me to recover psychologically also from that fear. Uh, and uh, this project is called Rust Breath, uh, which is also, I think, <laughs> really related to what is happening right now. And it's a, it's a mask, uh, which is also combined with the organ, with the musical organ. And it's a nice game of, uh, of words, I, would, I, I think, here, like uh, last, uh, the organ as a, as a physical uh, object inside of the body, and at the same time, organ as a, as a musical instrument. And uh, what is actually technically happening here, when you breathe, you don't need to do, you don't need to play it actually, you need to just wear it. So it's a passive instrument. The passive instruments is a kind of a concept I'm trying to um, extend and uh, develop right now. I have a few other projects, maybe I, I, if I will have time, I will also show, which are related to this topic. So it's an instrument which you don't need actually any skills to play on. Uh, your body is working, my body in this uh, case, is working just as a physical source of energy, of uh, air pressure over here. Of course, we can control our breath, you know, we can change intensity, we can change the pressure, we can change the, the speed uh, and, uh, you know, a few other parameters of that. And it's very interesting with the breath, especially because it's one of few functions, maybe the only function in the body which is completely automatical, automatic like um, autonomous and at the same time we can control it so we cannot do the same with the heart or maybe if you like do yoga every day then maybe you can do that uh, so and uh, you can just breathe normally like uh, flight attendants say in the in the airplane uh, so and um, i would say it's a it's a death mask so it's a mask for for actually process of dying uh, because um, what was the most important, the most important thought I had when I, when I was sick, that um, what I want to keep doing till the last moment of my life is, is uh, being creative and working as an artist, even if I have no energy and almost, I don't know, if, if my muscles are too weak to do anything, I still want to have any possibility, some possibilities to uh, do something, like play music, uh, compose music, or I don't know, invent something, work on something. So, and this mask is, uh, is an instrument uh, for myself, which could uh, keep me um, creative, even if I have nothing except just my, you know, my lungs that could still be active. And uh, yeah, it's, it's quite crucial maybe. And uh, from perspective of our days now, uh, I, I was even a bit afraid of that project. It was like looking maybe too tough. 
in first moments of this uh, pandemic situation. And I was even a bit scared of how, you know, how it's related to all these images of uh, many people on ventilators in the hospitals right now. Uh, but at the same time, uh, for me, it's a very important um, uh, um, example of how uh, we can uh, like work with these fears, work with these uh, problems. And even in that situation, in this crazy situation, we can still be creative and somehow rework all you know, this uh, crazy stuff uh, and uh, maybe inspire someone or just like help ourselves through art and um, you know yeah <laughs> maybe maybe you get the idea there is also a video but it's not that important you know to show it i will just like show you a few photos of that and uh, yeah so i probably gonna switch to the next one i don't know please tell me when i will be out of time but i will be well, trying. if you um like the initially if we were all on time that would be the time when you finish so if you you, you can probably talk about one more thing. Yeah, okay. Yeah, maybe I will just uh, talk very, very fast and then jump from one to another one just by showing photos, just to mm -hmm. create, mm -hmm. to, to show some examples. So another one, which is also related uh, to, to this concept of um, extended, uh, extended body and uh, uh, to passive instruments, instruments which doesn't require any skills to play and just use standard physiological processes of our body. So this one is, it has a Russian name. Topot means loud steps or something like that. When you step, when you step by your foot very loud. So, and um, it, 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 there is also a play with the words a bit here uh, because uh, we have a very famous uh, rocket, which is actually a MISO, uh, nuclear MISO, like a weapon, which is called Topol M. Uh, so it's a, and uh, I wanted to play a bit with this, uh, with this, uh, with this words. I don't know. Topole. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know if it makes any sense. Topole. So um, yeah, maybe for Russian speaking. So uh, and it's, it's actually a, a, a special device uh, which you need to wear, uh, and uh, it makes your steps very loud. Actually, uh, it's it's completely opposite to what uh, most of the like in in, in, in here like in Russia it's. Um, uh, it's very impolite to to walk very loud. I think everywhere in the world it's it's a bit impolite. So uh, as uh, as more quiet you are where, when you are walking, then more uh, polite you are. I don't know <laughs> if 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 if, if it really makes sense. But and uh, this machine is completely opposite. It makes it it, it makes your steps ex extremely loud. There are microphones in your foot in my foot or in a performer foot here in the, on the photos I have a model which was helping me to to document this project so and I made this um, and I made this uh, system for uh, for my own performance and uh, what it also also can do it can uh, switch your it can switch the sound of your steps to the sound of uh, some other people's steps I mean there there is a big uh, like there is in a memory a big uh, bank of sounds uh, of a completely crazy sound sometimes or a sounds of different surfaces uh, or uh, even different gender so you can like or i don't know just different kind of shoe type of shoes it doesn't import about the gender but uh, so when you like it's very fun when you switch uh, to the high heels mode and when you like I'm 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 a, I'm quite heavy, and then you have a sound of a like, a very like someone on the high heels uh, producing very light sounds, and I was quite impressed. So it was a very experimental project. I didn't know what I would get when when it would be done. So I was just like try like experimenting and trying something. But when I first tried it, and then I I switched to the sound of uh, broken glass when you like when you step on the glass or on the dry leaves on the on the street but you are still in the room it was creating really crazy experience because like it, it the system is responding really fast and very right in time when you when you step you get the sound immediately and um, i was like t testing different technical solutions for that and find a re really nice one and uh, it creates an experience like uh, just just the sound of your step could completely uh, change the way how you perceive your body actually and it was very impressive for myself so and uh, 
just by this very simple uh, change, you can like uh, completely change your identity for for a while because like uh, it looks like our brain is really um, uh, uh, is really um, sensitive, very very sensitive, calibrated to the, to the sounds because it it gives a lot of feedback of where we are what is our you know like state of mind even or the, like what is our weight of the body etc so yeah and uh, uh, there is, is also a very fun mode in this project which is even a bit political i, I didn't have this layer in this work before uh, someone uh, tell me about that so the, the layer is uh, that you can actually with the you know with the con small control panel i have in front of me you can actually loop the sounds and you could like create a sound of a crowd. Is it the right right word? Like when there's a lot of people there. So and you can just like walk a lot and change your samples, then record and then record more and more and more. And then at the end, you're sounding like there is like many people working at the same time. And um, like one voice is the voice of many people, which is uh, quite fun and important. If you go to the protest, you could create a feeling, not a feeling, but some kind of a like. Um, situation when you're sounding as many people and like for example in russia it's uh, it's uh, illegal to do a uh, protest of many people at the same time but if you are alone it's loud so but some system like that you maybe can use it you know for uh, for a protest and uh, have a voice of many people at the same time so yeah maybe i don't know the last maybe one that's I mean, okay so if i should stop then that's yeah okay. you, can, just, I was, we, I you just... can bring it in the discussion if you don't mind yeah yeah, yeah sure 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 mm -hmm. yeah thank so, you thank you very much uh dima uh, so i would like to give words to the last speaker in this panel uh, dominic Wassel. please dominic hi everybody i hope you can hear me yeah, yeah we can okay hear you perfect well. great thank you so then i'm going to share my screen if that works just give me a second to find the right presentation and first of all thank you so much for being here it's 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 really a, an exciting experience and i have to say i'm absolutely no artist so uh i'm going to do something completely different i can tell you a little bit about the future of robotics um let me see somehow it didn't want to show all that as it should let me see can you now see the presentation yes perfect okay perfect so um yeah again thank you very much for having me um i'm, I'm super excited and it's uh, uh really hard to speak after such great projects and uh, I, I i would have myself have so many questions about that um what i'm going to tell you about is uh, actually where we are in robotics because um, I have two hats. I'm a professor at HDBW in Munich and uh, head of robotics uh, at, a, at a German robotics company. And I have been developing robots for, for many years and um, I'm going to give you a glimpse into what is currently possible with robotics and what is robotics going to be like in the near future. What can I imagine that it might be in the next 10, 20, 30 years. Actually, I also want to make you aware with, uh, at the IEEE, we just launched a, a very big um, Delphi study on the future of robotics. We're going to ask 200 international experts about their opinion. Uh, so stay tuned. It's going to be published soon, hopefully. Uh, we're currently still in the process of, of asking those people on uh, what they think robotics will be in 2050, actually. Um, and so, as you see, usually my job is uh, trying to, to decipher the future. So I have this little crystal ball or here uh, uh, an Asian stick oracle and uh, people come up to me and ask me, well, Dominic, how is the future going to look like? And the problem is, I can tell you, nobody can predict the future, but what we can do is actually we can look into indicators to say something about the future. And uh, especially in technology, that is usually a funny thing because, um, as you see here, this is uh, one of my favorite pictures. Uh, it's uh, Otto von Gernsback, uh, actually a German inventor 
who <laughs> he invented the first TV glasses. So he believed that television would work as glasses. So we, we have been talking about, or there has been talking about uh, augmented reality and, and those things before. He is actually the pioneer of that. That was 1940 something when he invented those TV glasses. Obviously it never made it into a real product, but he believed that would be the future. So so it's, it's quite funny now because we laugh about it, but 80 years later, we, it, we, he will be, I think, the man of the hour because he is really he 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 predicted that uh, something that you wear on your head and that can project different content would actually be a great extension of your of your existing reality. Um, so the question with innovation usually is. Um, do you just have something new? So because innovation always is something new, which is an invention, and then it has to be successful. And unfortunately, he was lacking the latter part. He, he didn't make it to success. Now, as I said, it's very hard to predict the future. And usually I talk a lot about these, these, these mega trend analysis and all that. I, I, I don't want to do this today because we don't have too much time for it, but I, I, I still want to raise awareness for it. So in 1982, somebody called Nasbit wrote a great book, and he was looking at trends that will be around for at least 25 years and that have global impact. And uh, so, so there is a slideshow running through of those. So there would be connectivity or the, the change in the mobility paradigm or how we perceive our agenda and climate change, which I think can no longer be denied by anybody but the, the American president, um, urbanization, gentrification, and all these huge trends. By analyzing them, we can say how the world is going to evolve and how the world is going to look like in the next 25 to 30 years. And from that, we can then derive what will be the needs of people and how might we be able to address those and solve those or, or maybe help people in, in dealing with them through technology. And uh, so you could actually sum it up and say, we're, we're living in the Anthropocene, in the human-made age. So in literature, you now find that um, about 140 years ago, humans started to have such a huge impact on, on, on our planet by technology, by the first industrial revolution, the second, the third, now even the fourth with digitalization, that, that it's no longer like before um, uh, at the Iron Age, so metal or dinosaurs or something else that is giving uh, names to the eons, but it is ourselves. It's humans and humans with technology. So, so I think we have a very big responsibility because we are shaping how our future is going to look like. And astoundingly, you, even in industrial robotics of where I'm coming from and also consumer robotics and everything, we're, we're heavily affected by this trend, which is the demographic change. And I have been running around with this slide for a while. And so I think six or seven years, and it, it always sounded so distant, but it's here, it's today. So in 2020, in this very year, okay, I know we're facing much other problems now, but in this very year, now more than half of the German population is older than 50 years. And uh, now you could say, well, this is a nice German problem or a first world problem, but no, the United Nations and the OECD are predicting that this is going to propagate around the globe and the latest by 2035, 2040 something, we will have an overaging population everywhere in the world. And what results from that is, well, several things. First of all, we might have to work longer because uh, it, we, we might even run out of human labor, which sounds completely contradictory. But um, so the, the issue is if people are getting older, more and more people are retiring, but not enough people are born. At a certain point, we will run out of human labor. So what that means that human labor is not no longer going to be the cheap muscle it used to be in the first industrial revolution. So when we said like, yeah, okay, it's great that we have people that can put stuff in machines and they don't have to think at all. Now it's completely the opposite. So we might head to a world where, where we actually need humans for what they're best at, which is for their intelligence, their creativity, their knowledge, and their gut feeling, because understanding these things in betweens that machines cannot understand. Um, now you could also say, yeah, okay, but again, first world problem. No, not really. The OECD is predicting that this is going to be a global trend. And by 2045, at latest by 2050, 
we are going to run into a global labor shortage. And it's already starting in Asia. China is now outsourcing either to Africa or to other Asian countries. And after other Asian countries and Africa, we're running out of world. So, so we once went around the globe and now we, we, we have to automate. We have to support people so that they can still keep up the work for sure. If somebody tells you this is not going to change our job landscape and the environment we're working in, sorry to say it so bluntly, but they're lying to you because they surely it will have fundam it bring fundamental changes with it because the type of work is going to change, the type of education is going to change, the skills we need is going to change. And we will have to look into how to requalify the people that might lose their jobs today um, and, and see that they can be still active in the future. Ultima ratio, if you think that even further, the interesting idea that comes up with that is, well, now let's assume we might make it to full automation um, and it would free a lot of human capacity, like the washing machine, for example, freed a lot of time when it was invented because a lot of time in families, especially for for the female members of the families, went into washing and doing all, 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 all the um, the cleanup. And when the washing machine was invented, a lot of time was free that then could be redirected to what other things, well, usually still household or, or working in a factory or something like that, but at least it was redirected. And I think we're at the edge of another such revolution because if, if full automation is really going to happen or at least partial automation, then humanity might end up with, a mu with much more free time that could be directed towards other things. You know, there is discussion about the universal basic income and, and, and other concepts, which, I, which, which would be a different presentation. But it is really interesting which role technology would be taking, although technology doesn't have to be intelligent in itself because an industrial robot is not intelligent it's just repetitively doing the same tasks over and over million times but it might help us to free time for humanity for for other things if you combine it i i believe in four robotic revolutions and uh, the first robotic re revolution has already happened it's what we used to do for the last 40 years so how to bolt and weld and glue a car together as fast as possible so this is the first manufacturing line of ford um, ford did something really unprecedented he could build a car in 91 minutes what you see here in the background well that's jake he's not so important but what you see in the background is kdpo um, there kuka is producing the body and white of the jeep wrangler and one body in white is now produced in 71 seconds. So from 91 minutes, we went down to 71 seconds. And, and that actually means that um, the, in, in, in four minutes, you can produce three cars. Okay, yeah, I'm exaggerating a bit, not the whole car, but the body in white, but you get the drift. The, what you also see is that those robots live in cages. It's basically a robot zoo because those robots are too dangerous, are too, too heavy, too fast, uh, so that they could interact with humans. So for me, who's believing in service robotics and consumer robotics is not really sexy. The second revolution is when we uncage the robot. So you can now build robots, and here I have a Bavarian application for you. You can uncage a robot so that it can work without a fence around it. So you can directly interact with the machine. And in this this uh, exhibit here, it uh, was pouring pouring wheat beer. The interesting part, though, is it's still a dumb machine, and I'm I'm I, I'm sad to say it, but there is no intelligence in that at all, because if I swap the bottles, if I put a Coca-Cola or lemonade bottle there, then the robot will break the bottle because it's exactly programmed to that glass. It is exactly programmed to that bottle. So we are still far away from, from really intelligent robotics. The third revolution is when they're going to become mobile because then they're going to drive around and especially with telepresence, I can go to the person that I want to interact with and I no longer have to go to the robot. But as you see here, and this, this used to be one of the first examples when this has been applied in industrial manufacturing, you have 25 kilograms of robot and 400 kilograms of battery. And the reason is because we don't have enough energy density so that we could use a robot for 12 hours uh, without carrying around half a ton of battery. And this is very limiting because I don't think that anybody of you would like to have something like that in their homes. And uh, so, yeah, this is, this is, by the way, one of the biggest issues of robotics today. And then hopefully the fourth revolution will be when 
artificial intelligence and robotics are finally getting together. And I always love thinking of, I don't know if you remember these cartoons, so like uh, the Jetsons from the 70s. And, and the Jetsons had this robot housekeeper, which is called Rosie. And it's a very great example, although they still have a little bit of, of product issues here, as you might see. So I don't know if you want your robot to interact with your guests like this. But anyways, this is a different story. But I hope that finally we're getting there. And uh, but, but it's a really, really hard task. So actually it leads down to the question, what is a robot? Because, and we, we touched upon this before. So uh, a lot of what is today automation in software is now called robotic process automation, which I think is terrible because actually it's not a robot. For me, a robot does always need a physical representation, not because I'm building some, but be just because I think, there are agents out there like software agents or intelligent assistants or whatever you want to call them, but there are robots and robots do have to have a physical manifestation. Um, I have some examples of them. So uh, one of the most fr uh, that, that freaks people out the most is usually Boston Dynamics and the Atlas. Although as, a, as an engineer, it's absolutely stunning what Mark Rybert and his team has done there. So it's really amazing. So you, it, this robot can navigate in, 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 in open terrain and it's, it, it it's absolutely awesome. On the other hand, if you think about the human human in there, um, in the loop, um, imagine you went, you go jogging to the woods and this robot shows up. I think you would be freaking out and so would I. And and so, so this is one of the biggest problems. So we can do amazing things with technology, but uh, for, for people, it's either hard to understand or it is even scary. Well, there, there are actually two types. So either it is completely scary or they're super, super excited, this, which would then be the Hollywood effect because they're influenced by Star Wars and R2-D2 and our uh, C-3PO and all those cool robots. Unfortunately, either if they're afraid of the Terminator or excited by Star Wars or whatever, they still have the perception that robotics will happen in the next five years. And unfortunately, this is not true because what you don't see in these videos is currently this is controlled by nine people. It has a, a, a battery capacity of 15 minutes and it, it still it, it balances automatically and it, it, but it cannot lift those boxes autonomously. It has been programmed into the system and a lot of those things have to be programmed before they're operational. Well, then you might know this as well. This is now even commercially available, Spot, so the robot dog, and he's going to mistreat this poor creature now a bit. And uh, the funny thing is, um, a lot of people re immediately react to that. So um, because it, it moves so much like an animal and when he then starts and you're going to see that in a second, he's going to pull his, the tail of the robot. Uh, a lot of people go, oh my God, the poor doggy. And and the funny thing is you immediately have this, this emotional reaction to technology. Uh, oh, bite, this thing is no more, no more intelligent than your, your battery screwdriver or your coffee machine. And you would not be concerned about your coffee machine, but this immediately uh, arises an emotional reaction. And, and basically the, the, the foundation for that is the human wish for anthropomorphism. We try to put a soul into things. And, and you all know that because usually what we do is, well, I, I think everybody has already in their life at least once been yelling at their car or their computer or their laptop because they simply didn't work in the moment when we needed them. And that has to be pure intention. They're just evil pieces of technology. And same thing applies to robots. So people immediately uh, put emotions into them, even if they're so unpersonal or at least in a, from a human perspective as spot. And then you can build completely different robots. So this is a robot purely made out of silicon. It doesn't have a single rigid part. And uh, um, the interesting part there is it is nearly indestructible. You can run over it with a car. You can hammer it. You can burn it. You can drop it from a plane. And it's still working. In a humanitarian setting, like these robots squeezing into, into uh, uh, a an catastrophe site, like after an earthquake and identifying survivors, this is absolutely great. In a military setting, like 200,000 of those being deployed to identify targets, that is absolutely horrifying. So you see technology itself is pretty unbiased and it depends on how in which context we put it. 
uh, you can apply similar technologies to build even non-rigid robots, which might be you could it might mean you could build a robot that unfolds from somewhere. So a, a little hatch opens, and then a robotic arm is come is extending. So this, apart from the little metal pieces on the outside, this robot is just a rubber tube or a combination of rubber tubes, and it can access every point in space around it. So um, this is the, the next evolution of robotics, so to say. So robots don't have to be rigid anymore. They will be much more lightweight. They will be uh, easy to carry. And they will also be very, very um, robust. But it's not just uh, just just limited to, uh, to, to industrial robotics. So this, for example, is uh, so Festo is usually once a year doing a, a nice uh, animal prototype. And this is now a robot dragonfly, which has 13 degrees of freedom, can no longer be controlled by the human hand. And you need artificial intelligence to control the wings and make this thing fly because it's so insanely complex. The dragonfly doesn't know about it, so it simply flies, <laughs> um, the, the real one. Um, and and so, so there are a lot of possibilities with technology, even accumulating in things like this, like Geminoid by, by Hiroshi Ishiguro, who built his, 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 his own idol uh, and copied himself because he doesn't want to go to, to conference anymore, or even Hugh Herr, who uh, is currently one of the researchers building the best prosthesis in the world because he lost both his legs in a climbing accident, and now he really dedicated himself to, to building these prostheses. The interesting part, though, is that he even goes so far that he says the future of human evolution will be technology, and his ultimate goal is to build the best legs so that healthy people, all of us, will be willing to cut off their healthy legs and replace them by bionic legs because they are better, they're faster, they, are, they, they offer new sensory feedback whatsoever they can be configured. And so from this point of view, I think we immediately get into an ethical discussion. And I know I'm, I, I don't have too much time, but I, I, I still want to leave you with some of the questions. It's not just like the trolley problem that you might know about autonomy. And there are these these awfully constructed uh, examples like, yeah, how should you decide to 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 kill one person or five people or myself? Honestly, the the best solution I heard for this 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 uh, this puzzle lately was, if you're sitting in a car and you cannot avoid an accident and you, somebody will have to die, how about we let the car just randomize you have absolutely no control and technology is taking the responsibility away from you and you will have to see what is going to happen this might not be fair for any of those those people involved but overall it might be the fairest solution uh, but there is a lot of dispute about that then there's the question how do we do do we want to interact with robots in our workplace uh, do we have a right to object to interact with technology or will technology just become like somebody said before like electricity an uh, omnipresent technology that is simply enhancing our our our, our life how human-like should Romans be? Um, is there a point where we cannot differentiate anymore? And do we have to tell people? Now with those humanoid robots, it might not, make, uh, might not be so imminent, but if you have an, a virtual assess, assistant like Siri, Alexa, or whatever interacting with, with humans, and especially with children, do you have to tell them that they're interacting with a machine? Or uh, can you just trick them into believing that this is a human being. Even worse with, with uh, taking care of the elderly and then also body augmentation and uh, stellar absolutely amazing things that you have been presenting there. And sorry, I didn't didn't choose your work, but I chose Harbinson here as a picture. But um, so, so he implanted a, um, a camera into his brain. And, and so, so is that, then we get to the questions of, of body modding and augmentation. Are we allowed to mod our bodies? Are we forced to mod our bodies? Are we, it might it be necessary to, to one day for the human race to survive in order to extend our human capabilities? And in the end, if we really build 
an artificial intelligence that might have its own perception and might have it develop its own beliefs. I'm very skeptical that this is possible, but in case it might be possible, and if we put it in a robot, then it completely alters our view on creation. No matter if you're atheist or what you believe, but somehow life has been created or been happening on this planet and in the universe. And then for the first time, humans would really construct and build a sort of life, a sort of being. For the Until now, so far, we only have been altering life. We have been selecting, we have been breeding, we have been gene editing. But then for the first time, it would completely alter our position in the, in the, in the picture of creation because we become the creators. And well, the question is how this is ongoing. So um, usually I would, would love to show this a bit more, but th this is the current state of robotics. So nobody has to be afraid of that right now because, uh, and, and many of you might have seen that it's from DARPA challenge. And the mean thing they did was instead of giving them a lab presentation and say like, your robot has to do this one very task in two minutes, they gave them five or 10 tasks, which was simply walk 200 meters in a straight line, try to open a door, uh, operate a valve. And this is what happened. So. Um, with that, uh, I only have two slides left and uh, sorry for, for also running a bit over time, but I do believe the future of robotics has already started and uh, it will be fundamentally connected with software and artificial intelligence. It's no longer hardware that we're building. We are building mechatronical systems and we have to think about how much impact they're going to have on our lives. I don't believe what Bill Gates said, who said a robot in every home by 2025, but I might see this in 2040 or 2060. Um, what I do see though, is that our grandchildren will grow up in daily contact with automation technologies and they will have different faces, but that means that they are the first generation R of robotic natives. And the funny thing is I have been also running around with this idea for a long time. Um, over the last three years, we now got two children. So we have a boy of two and a half and a, and a girl of 11 months. And you look at them and you go like, God damn, actually it's going to affect them and especially their children. They are going to grow up in daily contact with, with that. And they're, they're no longer going to be digital uh, uh, natives. They're going to be robotic uh, natives. And we are going to be robotic immigrants because we are going to experience that and we will have presumably the same struggles that our parents had with the internet and smartphones and all those technologies with all these automation that is going to happen. And it will have different forms from automated flashlights to autonomously driving cars to maybe drone deliveries one day to our doorstep. And uh, I do have good friends working at Amazon on these technologies and they really want to pull this off to human robot collaboration. And then, well, yeah, to the, the love of my life, my wife, forgive, uh, uh, to the robotic housekeeper, to Jetson's Rosie. So <laughs> robots at home. And yeah, in, in order that this doesn't get out of hand, I do believe we have to regulate it. And I'm researching in the field of robotic governance. And uh, yeah, so, so, so that's it. That's my view on the future of robotics. It's going to happen. It has a lot of impact and we have responsibility to shape it the right way. And so it's so great that events like these exist where interdisciplinary exchange can happen. And again, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dominic, for uh, this uh, very uh, realistic and yet optimistic uh, closure of, uh, of our discussion. I actually had no idea that uh, it takes uh, 500 kg um, to, for um, for a KUKA robotic hand to operate for uh, for 12 hours. So I'm actually amazed that like our panel here would, uh, would if uh, a KUKA robot was doing this panel instead of me, Laura and Delia, uh, we would have to store 500 kg of battery somewhere. So we are um, incredibly, uh, incredibly superior. So um, I would like to, finalize uh, what what have what have been said uh, just very briefly and open up for one question um, maybe uh, from the participants um, 
So we've been talking about uh, issues of teleoperation, about the double absence and uh, the fractality of the flash and the phantom flash. We've been talking about the possibility of experiencing other uh, human body, but also the possibility of experiencing the whole city. Uh, we've touched on uh, the passive instrument and the possibility of blood, the electricity of our body, to be the power for this uh, passive musical instrument. Uh, we, uh, we realize that the body is going to change in, uh, in the future and the uh, integrated, uh, the machines integrated in, in the cyber mechanism integrated in it can be uh, not fantasies, not metaphors, but the reality. So uh, I'll uh, ask if anyone has questions to any of the speakers. Uh, and then maybe, uh, well, you, you look like someone who has a question or, or uh, I don't know, uh, or a final comment or um, Laura? Yes, the, there is a question like from the artistic perspective and from the mm -hmm. also company point of view, how do you think the evolution of technology can deepen in the device of society? Uh, maybe now more than ever because technology has always been expensive. Mm -hmm. so we, uh, this is a question to one person. Uh, okay, one let, uh, Dominic, please. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, I, I, I think it has to be an obligation that we, um, especially with automation, that we don't just build automation for rich people. And uh, we have been looking into this a lot in our work. So um, if you look at the Maslow pyramid of human needs, Unfortunately, what happens currently, all the robotic toys are absolutely at the top. They're expensive show-off toys for rich people. But there is this whole domain, for example, to help people do better and, and more effective farming. So if you look at the social development goals um, that the United Nations are looking at, then one of the most important one is end human hunger. And they're clearly saying with the current population growth, we will have to get generate 30% more output from our agricultural activities, but we cannot do this without automation and without technology. And I do believe that it, we need cheap technology that is robust and is accessible to a lot of people. And I'm also very fond of all these open source activities because this is this can be the only way that we distribu distribute technology. And I'm actually very concerned about these super or mega companies that you mostly see also in the US that that are uh, keeping all the knowledge that they're developing in, in, and, and, and protecting them with patents because what you and what most of us are doing in our universities is actually we use public money to generate knowledge and give it back to the public so that, can pe that people can apply it. And I think this is something where we have to start that technology, at least basic technology, has to be open, accessible, and that we really help to democratize the access to technology and so that, that everybody can use it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Stella, did you want to say something? Or... Can oh, I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Uh, Dominique, nice to see you uh, again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, it's uh, very great that you're participating in our event uh, and you are still promoting uh, the ideas about the robotic governance but sure. <laughs> uh, can you uh, tell me uh, what's uh, the difference uh, in situation uh, what was uh, two years ago, for example, and right now? Uh, do you see any changes in the applications of robotics or uh, sense of robotics or maybe some legal aspects? Because uh, there is a... I know uh, several uh, examples that uh, really um, invert the situation uh, to the robotic side. But uh, I want to ask you, do you feel something like this? 
Well, I think I, I, I could go into technical details, but I won't. But uh, what I, what in general, what happens is there is a lot more awareness on the topic, I feel. But it is not robotic itself. It is subsumized in, in the field of artificial intelligence because now everybody is rushing for regulation of artificial intelligence, good artificial intelligence, the impact of artificial intelligence on society. But if you closely look into the uh, pro uh, programs also by the European Commission and so on, and you, I, I know you're familiar with that, they, they see robotics now as embodiment of artificial intelligence. And so, yes, what I think is good is there's a lot of a, a lot more awareness on the topic there is also progress in the in in the field of uh, of applications so um you might know the german newspaper der spiegel so the mirror um and uh, der spiegel was had had a huge story last week about that robotics is finally there it it that robotics made it into retail our homes and that it's going to be here soon well, I think they're, they're a bit too off euphemistic, but I think we, uh, compared to two years ago, uh, robotics and artificial intelligence and the discussion about it has become much more mainstream with all the problems that are associated with it, because now all the big companies try to, to shape the public opinion on this. And I think it's more recent than ever to come up with a, with a neutral view on that. And so, for example, the United Nations and also other uh, other uh, neutral or, or non-governmental bodies have come up with opinions on that. And I think this is a very good step. And this is how we have to be keeping up, uh, uh, keep, keep up working on it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dominic, uh, uh, Stel, Dmitri, uh, Maris. Um, anyone um, wanted to say something? I just want to keep the balance between the uh, robotic people and artistic people. <laughs> Can, can, can I actually ask a question? Please, uh, Stel wanted to say something for it. Can I? I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, Dominic, uh, please, please ask okay. a question. Dominic, okay, so Dominic, please. It, it was respond. exactly, it, 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 it was um, and not, not just limited, but mainly to you, um, which is actually, uh, do, do you think, what do you think about this, this discussion about limiting the rights to augment your own body? Because you have been doing this for a long mm -hmm. while and then you surely have been struggling with this. So do you think I should be allowed to do that or do you think we need regulation? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, in the, in the uh, early, early 70s, actually, I, I wrote a little text that said the problem now is not so much with freedom of ideas, but rather freedom of form, freedom to modify your body. And, um, and, and the more, I, uh, the more um, interaction I have with body modification uh, community, um, you know, the more, the more you kind of, you know, respect their attempts at experimentation um, and, and going to extremes and, and, you know, the, with the performance artist, um, it's not enough to uh, simply speculate in ideas. Uh, you have to take the physical consequences of your of your actions and um i think the the body modification community does that having said that it, primarily it's in the mode of sort of sculpting the body uh decorating the body with piercings and so on uh i think though we see the beginnings in the grinder community of inserting chips um, under the skin. And um, I think that's where it's going to go increasingly now. There's going to be a more intimate uh, connection between our technologies and, and, and our bodies, not simply uh, technology external to the body, but technology as components of the body itself. Um, and we're seeing this primarily now in, um, in medical and pathological applications. Uh, I'm, I um, saw at a medical conference in Paris actually 
15, 20 years ago now, I forgot, um, the, the, uh, um, someone who had Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. And uh, they showed a, a video of this person who totally uncontrollable, uh, couldn't dress himself, couldn't feed himself. Uh, but they implanted a little device that controlled the electrical um, activity of his brain. And he was there at the conference, completely normal, co completely subdued of any Parkinson's uh, symptoms. Um, now, of course, neural implants will go beyond uh, the treatment of pathologies to more, you know, cosmetic reasons and, and more, um, you know, uh, direct ways of connecting us to computational systems and the internet. And I think because the body, as well as our ethics, are unstable constructs, uh, we have to be open to change and we have to be open to manage these new technologies and how they're used. Uh, Paul Virilio, um, you know, stated that uh, with every new technology, there's a new kind of accident. <laughs> so whatever technologies we develop, we have to manage them. Um, and uh, there are risks. Wow. Thank you very much uh, to all the speakers. And uh, I will finally uh, transfer us to the next panel, which is called Telefact.